Okay, uh, greetings and salutations to everyone. I am Celestial Saturn and I'm back with another dating sim, apparently. This one's called Touch Starved. Uh, basically, I was just perusing through Twitter and I saw a little glimpse of it and I kind of like the art style and it's on Kickstarter and all of that. So it's in the works and it's just like the demo of it right now so i'm kind of curious what this is about because it's supposedly like dark and gritty and stuff and that is just like so super my thing i'm so sorry but like uh yeah i i just had to turn down some of this I'm just gonna do it like that for right now because yeah that stuff was loud as hell so hopefully you can at least hear the intro but if not I'll just uh, either redo it later on or just not care anyways enough posturing I'm pretty sure we are a good bit into this as far as recording wise so let's start. This is a downed product of the Touch Star Prologue and not the finished product. Thank you, Red Spring Studio. It's a tip for older audience. It contains mature content, includes but not limited to horror, graphic violence, strong language, alcoholic, and drug references, injury, and dismemberment. Player discretion is advised. Fair enough. If you accept the embargo terms and content warning, please click to proceed. In Touch Starved, your choices matter. The decisions you make will result in unique dialogue, interactions, or even choices in red text, which contains exclusive content. Try playing through the demo more than once and choosing different options. You might even uncover a secret ending. And remember, there are no wrong choices, only interesting ones. Choose wisely and save often. I think I'm going to like this game. Enter your name. Saturn. Like the planet. Choose your pronouns. She, her. Okay, first off, I'm loving this ethereal music. This, this is nice. The world began to unravel long before you were born. Whoops. What did I just do? Okay. It began with fog fall. Spectral mist bled from the seams where reality wore thin. And from the fog emerged monsters, inhuman beings with unnatural powers. Some possessed language and intellect, others were mindless beasts driven by a little more than the desire to slaughter. As cities fell and unrest spread, humans united in their fear while monsters thrived in chaos. And then there's you. You're not even sure if you're human. You were born cursed. What hands that alter the minds of anyone you touch? Choose your backstory. Ooh. Let's see. The unnamed. You were raised as an oracle in a remote temple. The priest claimed your touch bestowed enlightenment, but a visiting mage revealed your curse for what it was. Following the Major's word, you fled in search of Synovium. You regularly experience unnatural premonitions that rattle your body and soul. An innate sixth sense gives you a heightened awareness of hidden supernatural presences around you. The Hound, you are raised by society's outcast criminals who accepted you when nobody else would. Your partner in crime, a friend since childhood, helped you steal enough money for a cure then betrayed you. They left you with only enough coin to travel to Synovium, your last hope. You have sharply honed social inter intuition. You can survive and even thrive in the bloody, in the violent underbelly of any city. 
using your experience with the underworld to get ahead. Or the alchemist. An exiled Synovium mage took you in as a child, raising you as her apprentice. She seemed to take pity on your curse, but you discovered that she was cultivating you as a test subject. You fled to you fled the Synovium seeking a cure. You're an experienced spellcaster with encyclopedic knowledge of alchemy, spellcraft, and history. With a little observation, you can identify the subtle effects of magic. So the unnamed, the hound, and the alchemist. Definitely alchemist. You sound so cool. Your name is Saturn. You selected those pronouns. Your backstory is the alchemist. Is this correct? Yes. The wasteland stretches as far as the eye can see. There is nothing out here but death. The ever-present stench of decay and countless sun-bleached bones cast like seeds across the barren land. I could say death doesn't scare me, but to tell the truth, I'm desperate. It's been two weeks since I joined a caravan bound across the waste. Finding a group that would accept me was a trial in itself. As rations grew sparse and my canteen ran dry, I began to despair, but then I saw it. Eridia, the city of knowledge, one of the last bastions of humanity left in the world and home to the famous academy called the Synovium. All the world's knowledge gathered in one place. If there's anywhere I'll find a cure for my curse, it's there. All that stands between me and a cure is a final stretch of salt-soaked waste. Or so I think until I see the first tendrils of, fall snake, of fog snaking beneath the wagon. Is this fogfall? My stomach sinks at the fairy whisper of it. A silent storm more devastating than fire. Dangerous in cities, but a death sentence beyond them. A thick blanket of fog engulfs us, smothering out the lantern's light. The wagon lurches to a stop. An eerie silence, heavy as the mist falls over us. The only warning we get is a strangled scream. St stay back. No. The cry dissolves into wet gurgling. Yikes. Then the wagon violently pitches to the side. I hit the ground hard. The air punched from my lungs. When I open my eyes, adrenaline lends sudden, awful clarity to the carnage around me. A trader I once shared bread with lies face down in the mud, their back reduced to long strings of torn muscle. Gleaming gristle and exposed bone, bodies litter the wasteland. I try to rise, but my ankle explodes with pain, so blinding, white blooms across my vision. Only when my eyes just do I see the dark shape in front of me. A solace stoops over the twisted form of a caravanner. I freeze, but it swivels its head. A dozen bulging eyes twitch in every direction and blink as one. The solace lets out an ear-splitting shriek and runs at me. But right before it reaches me, the beast barrels past, vanishing into the mist. Distantly, a horse screams in the dark. I need to move now. I mean, the wagon's screwed. Run to the city. I take off running deeper into the haze. The falls is so thick that I fear I'm heading the wrong direction until I see a dim pinprick of light emanating from the shadow of a spire. It's faint, but it's enough. I came too far to die here. Rabbit footsteps echo all around me. I run in circles, frantically searching the opaque mist for the source, but the fog falls, twists, and stretches sound. Suddenly, the caravan's driver bursts forth from the fog. Our eyes meet too late. He slams into me, knocking me to the ground and slips in a patch of mud. The solace falls on him as soon as he slows. 
It catches the driver by his throat and rakes his stomach with razor sharp claws. He comes apart like wet paper, spilling intestines and viscera in a steaming tide. Finding the urge to heave, I claw frantically through the slippery muck for his handhold. Shit. My hand catches the jagged edge of a rib jutting from the water, bandages unfurl around the gorge torn deep in my palm. The pain quickly forgotten when a hand closes around my wrist. Can you stand? One of the travelers from the caravan leans over me. You, we need to run. They reach for my hand, and I realize too late that the bandages have come undone. No, don't touch me. The sensation of their thumb brushing the back of my hand sends a shiver down my spine. All it takes is one touch, and in the space of a breath, my curse takes hold. Their lips peel back into a deranged grin. Well, I'm seeing that in my frickin' nightmares. Yeah. No, I've seen this face countless times before. This is my curse. Madness of my own making. Their grip on my hand tightens until pain radiates from my knuckles. Let me go. Suddenly, clammy hands rush, crush my throat, choking off my breath. Die, 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 die. Spit bubbles at the corners of their mouth and flex my face. The edges of my vision darken as my lungs scream for air. Ooh. I mean, screaming is something. I try to scream, but the fingers squeezing my windpipe cut me off. The more I struggle, the tighter their grip grows. My pulse hammers in my ears, slowing with each thudding beat. This can't be happening. I'm going to die. And not because of the fall, fall or the solace, but because of my own curse. Tears sting my eyes. No, 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 not here. Not like this. The hands drop from my neck, leaving me wheezing for air. My lungs burn with each ragged cough. My vision clears and the traveler's face takes shape, hovering inches from mine. Lips split in that macabre spiral even as blood seeps between their teeth. They give one last shuddering breath, then slump over, the claws hooked through their stomach. The soulless shoves the body aside, and the glowing eyes studding its leathery skin, as though grinning. There's a flash of claws, red spills across my vision. I thought there'd be pain, but as I sink into the murky water, all I can feel is the grit of silt filling my mouth and the icy embrace of the shallow water. Distantly, I notice an arm resting among the outcrop of reeds. Mine, neatly severed at the elbow. What have I gotten myself into? It should have taken both arms. Without them, maybe I could have survived. Maybe I could have had a home. Instead, I'll die cold, alone, and face down in a desolate wasteland. A fitting end for a monstrosity like me. If this is death, it's not as bad as I feared. The cold is gone, as is the choking stench of bog water. I could drift forever, cocooned in oblivion until all thought and sensation vanished. No curse, nobody howling at me in madness and terror, nothing at all. The thought has a terrible appeal to it. But the next moment, I take a reflexive breath, air pours into my lungs, then out again in a ragged gas. Mm -hmm. Feeling comes flooding back, warm cloth on my bare skin, a firm surface beneath me, a strange tang of sulfur in the air. Do not be afraid. I twist my head towards the voice. Tears flood my bleary, veer Ugh. my bleary vision as the bright glow of the lamplight. 
Try not to move. The voice is calm, steady, and commanding, but more importantly, it's a stranger's voice. One thought cuts through my mental fog. I have no idea who this is, and I'm completely at their mercy. So stay away from me. My words come out in a little more than a creaky whisper. I clamp my mouth shut, hating how weak and helpless I sound. No. No? Who the hell is this? I'm sitting up. I manage to push myself up on one elbow, but my head swims and my surroundings give an alarming lurch. Ah, a stubborn patient. I don't have the strength to dignify that with a response. Instead, I pull the sheet up higher and wipe my eyes until my vision clears. The stranger towers over my prone form. Warm light reflects off his pristine medical coat. I instinctively shrink back and that's when I notice that I'm completely naked except for the thin I have questions mostly of who did it instead of why am I naked lying on a low cot with a pair of sharp golden eyes watching my every move the man's gaze flickers to my exposed, unbandaged hands. I plunge my hands under the sheet to hide them from sight. Those too late, he must have noticed what they look like. Strange, cursed, inhuman. I brace myself for his inevitable suspicion and disgust, but his expression doesn't even flicker from that courteous smile. He just watches in placid silence as I struggle to make sense of my surroundings. Where am I? Who are you? Be calm. You're safe here. Whoever this is, he clearly has no idea who or what I am. I've never been safe anywhere with anyone. Even my own mentor, my teacher. I thought I was nothing but a convenient specimen to be used and discarded. I scowl, pulling the sheet protectively around myself. Where are my clothes? That should have been your first question. The man's golden eyes narrow slightly. A sharp sigh rustles the papers in his hands. I see you're not to be dissuaded. Your clothes were torn to shreds when I found you, but I procured replacements. With a soft creak, he stands from his chair, giving me a better view of my surroundings. I seem to be in some sort of medical clinic. Bottles of silvery alchemetto concoctions line the counters in neat rows. The air makes my nose twitch. I think with a smoke and something distinctly metallic that I can't quite place. The doctor procures a large, dense bundle of cloth, which he sets at the foot of my cot. He e he's easily a head taller than most and I have to crane my neck to look at him. Uh, yeah, thank you and everything, but could you please leave so I can change? I left my head looking defiantly into those golden eyes. Could you step out first? I'm not getting dressed with you standing here. To my surprise, the man's mouth quirks. I was not planning on watching. Good, sweet, leave. Still smiling to himself, he disappears through the narrow door. I hear a soft click as the lock turns behind him. I count to three. In the sudden silence, when I don't hear any more footsteps, I reach for the bundle of clothes. An itch on my elbow stops me short. I reach down absently to rub it, then realize, and then freeze when my fingers meet a neat line of stitches. I know what I saw. That beast took my arm clean off. And yet, my arm shows no sign of injury, apart from the black stitches poking through the skin. I gingerly flex my arms, feeling my heart race at the sensation. This is impossible. I should be dead, or at the very least, gasping out my last breaths 
I squeezed my eyes shut, waiting for the pleasant dream to unravel, to wake up bleeding out in the swamp. But nothing happens. The seconds tick by, and my arm remains resolutely healed, my surroundings pristine and quiet. In numb disbelief, I reach out for the replacement clothes and begin to stiffly pulling on them. They're thicker and warmer than mine were, with a black woolen cloak to go with them. But there's one thing still missing. My bandages. The golden-eyed man didn't leave me with any, even though I know he saw my hands. I slide off the bed and take a few unsteady steps towards the drawers. If this is indeed a doctor's clinic, there must be bandages somewhere. I start opening drawers at random, and of course, when the door swings, that's when the door swings open once more. Are you looking for something? I whirl around, clutching the thick roll of clean bandages. I try to step back from him, but my legs bump up against the edge of the cot. Your caution is understandable, though if I meant you any harm, you would know. That doesn't make me feel better in the slightest, but he makes no move towards me, so I quickly wind the bandages around my hands. The glowing scars and mottled skin disappear under a layer of clean white cotton. May I ask why you need additional bandages? I clench my jaw. I know it will only be a matter of time before he asked about my hands, though the way he does it is strangely roundabout. Uh, just declined to answer. Well, that's a very personal question and I don't really want to answer. Is that so? Surely you realize that I can only help if you tell me what ails you. An involuntary snort of laughter escapes me. Where would I even begin? Would he even believe me if I told him? No, best to keep my curse to myself for now and learn more about him first. Who are you? You may call me Cross. And where exactly am I? Iridia, which I assume was your caravan's destination. I can think of nowhere else a group of travelers to go. Iridia, so I made it to the city of knowledge after all. I should feel relieved, but all I can manage is a vague sense of increasing unease. How did I end up here? I brought you to my clinic, of course. You are the only survivor of the caravan, barely clinging to life and you needed immediate treatment. What you provided? Yes. He says it so simply, as if I'm a small child and he's explaining basic addition to me. I frown and flex the fingers on my recently healed arm. Aside from being a bit stiff, it feels fine. Thoroughly attached to me. You're saying you stitched my arm back on? pardon? A soulless attacked the caravan. It ripped everyone to shreds. It tore my my arm clean off. But when I woke up here, I spent my entire life learning from a synovium mage, and I know of no alchemy or magic that could reattach a severed limb. Even if he somehow could heal me by magic, I would detect traces of it but I sense nothing out of the ordinary at all. The doctor, Cross, pinches the bridge of his nose. He sits back down in his chair, quiet, for a long time. I do not know where you are from, but Iridia is the city of knowledge and deadly secrets alike. Information is power and is most unwise to give or receive it freely. Since you have refused to divulge your secrets, I will not divulge mine. I do not even know your name. I was just... You're new to Eredia, so I will overlook this specific breach of etiquette. However, you should not expect others to extend the same courtesy. Do you understand? 
He looks pointedly at my freshly bandaged hands. Loath, though I am to admit it, he has a point. I am also a complete stranger to him, and if he's telling the truth, he saved my life. I take a deep, steadying breath. This time, when I speak, I sound a bit more like myself. Saturn. My name is Saturn. It's a pleasure to meet you, Saturn. There's a little more warmth in his smile, his polite demeanor back in an instant. Yeah, thanks for the save. Yeah, thanks for saving me. I chance a smile in return, even if he won't explain how he did the impossible. There's no doubt in my mind that I'd be dead if not for Kras. Think nothing of it. I'm not sure if he's just being excessively courteous, but his own words only raise more urgent questions. But I have to ask, why did you save me? You don't know me. Hippocratic Oak, probably. The question seems to start across. I could hardly leave you to die in the waste. Assisting those in need is the very essence of a doctor's duty. I've never met a doctor who also handed out free clothes. My fingers find the edge of the cloak. There's a subtle but delicately embroidered pattern around the hem. I try not to think about what kind of price cross might ask for such well-made clothes. No, I suppose not. Forgive my presumption, I rarely come across so fascinating a patient. I blink. What did he just say? Ah, uh, I simply mean that a few would cling to life so resolutely or brave such a perilous journey to Eridia. I cannot help being curious about you, Saturn. His voice drips to a soft murmur. He abruptly looks away from me. You're pretty curious yourself. Am I? Well, I haven't forgotten about my arm. I wiggle my intact fingers at him. Clearly not. But you haven't asked me for any payment either, so... I require none from you. Travelers do not have an abundance of coin, and it would be unethical to leave you destitute in a strange place. I fall silent, unsure what to say to that. No one would help a horror like me for free. It was some kind of catch or trick. Right? A loud knock to the front door stops our conversation cold and spares me from having to say anything else. And you know what? This is where I'm going to end this. I'll just go ahead and save that. And we'll see who's at the door in the next video. So far, I'm liking this whole style. I like the cell shading. I like the background. Uh, a very interesting way to start a what is more like a hard dating sim, more or less. I want to see what this does. I really do.